tribe of Judah, roaring like a lion, watching giants fall, and make way for the King of glory, all strong and mighty, he is dressed for battle.
Bring my 
praise before you. I will always bring my praise before you. Cause I have a reason to praise. I have a reason to praise. I'll always bring your praise. I'll always bring you praise. I'll always bring you praise. I'll always bring you praise. I'll always be your praise. I have a reason to give thanks and praise him. Amen. You could be seated. Thank you for coming back. <sighs> Wendy's will never be the same, you know. <laughs> what are all these people doing here? Amen. Um, we, we actually don't experience as much as the Lord wants us to experience. And the reason why is we, we need some sort of validation or, or um, some sort of encouragement to go where we should be going anyway. And the reason why is, is that we've been abused. You know, we've been abused by the religious system. We've been abused by devils. We've been abused by situations. And a lot of the stuff that happens to us as people, we don't know how to file it. So we don't really resolve it. And um, I noticed something that might help you. And, and, and this comes in the professional area. When you're you're trained as a professional, you're really trained as a leader, and you're really trained to resolve. So you, you as a leader, you, you are to resolve and to be that person in any situation. So if something happens, you look to the leader and you watch their reaction. You wait for a validation. You wait for permission. You look to Jesus to see if how he reacts to something. That's what they would do. They watch. But see, the leader is supposed to be able to solve a problem, to, to lead people in or through or around. And God is really wanting us to get over some of the things that have happened to us. He didn't do those things to you. And that's what I just said is really the hardest part. The hardest part of what I was sent back for is getting people to not think the same way anymore. And how they think is we do this little Jimmy thing. It's just a, it's called jerry rigging it. It's like a, use a paper clip or duct tape is good for anything. But we fixed something, but it's really not fixed. <laughs> but duct tape's amazing. And um, I had, there was this uh, Southwest Airlines pilot. And he looked familiar. And uh, I found out that he was on several space shuttle missions. And he retired, just wanted to fly slower than the speed of sound for a while before he, he just went home to, you know, so he, he flew, he was a commander on several space, uh, you know, space shuttle missions. And um, it was really like, like retirement to him to fly at, at 450 miles an hour rather than having to slow down from 16,800 entering into the Earth's atmosphere and landing to 433 knots at a flare, touched down to 200. You know, this was easy to him compared to what he had to do. Because he was managing his whole thing from space it's in orbit at, at over 16,000 miles an hour and having to stop at Edwards Air Force Base or in Florida or Houston, you know, and touching down from 16,800 down to 200 knots when the nose gear came down and he deployed the drag chute. But I have a, I have a photo of him at home from space, several of them, and it's interesting the calmness is about him. But see, it's because he experienced a lot more than we will ever experience. 
And so things aren't, you know, and you, you'll notice this about people. They don't get uptight. But see, that they're, they're leaders. Okay, but the photo, I have it at home. And I always laugh every time I see it because he's in space. He's, you can see the earth through the shuttle side window. And by the way, the earth is round. And for all you flat earth pizza people out there, but there's a roll of duct tape behind his head in the space shuttle. And he goes, oh yeah, that stuff's great. See, so there's certain things that we just fix just to get by. But then what ends up happening is it ends up being a problem if you want to go on. If you don't have that resolution and that you don't take care of that, it doesn't just go away. And so these meetings like this with the atmosphere being, um, you know, intense at times and the holiness being very strong and and things will be dislodged and things will be resolved, but it can be abrupt and kind of like, you know, I mean, the devil is violent. He's a terrorist. It, you know, you do, don't, don't be nice to him because he's not going to return the favor. You know, you can't compromise. You can't, you can't negotiate with a terrorist. You know, you just wait for sniper one to take the shot, the green light. You don't, you don't, you don't mess by talking to the devil. He's, he's a liar anyway. So you have to know, you have to know that if you've tried to fix something on your own to deal with it, that today is your, your you don't have to hurt anymore. It, it's got to be resolved, okay? So this is the hardest thing for me, was what I saw in heaven was that God did not do all these terrible things that have happened to people. But yet, I have acquaintances and friends and where they have been through trauma and every now and then they react out of that wound that's still there. And it's not really them, but it is them because their personality has become like that demonic entity that is housed for some reason allowed to, to be in that area of their soul, not their spirit as a Christian, but in the area of the soul were very complicated. We were intricately, very, very uh, finely made. We're not made to be in a broken world. So we don't function well when things don't happen correctly. And so everybody wants to have a perfect everything because that's the way God made us. Now, is that clear? Because this is very hard. This is the hardest part of ministry is telling people that that the reason why you're frustrated is because you're actually having, you're, you're grieving because you have separation anxiety. You're separated from your father, not in spirit, but in this body down here, you have anxiety because you feel separated and ugly and yucky down here, but you're not. So you go to Destin and Panama City, and then you think that every beach is like that. You think every beach is sugar beach until you go to Hawaii and it's black sand. Or you go to Daytona and it's dirty. Well, see, you, you touch something that was pure. You got used to that. And then anything else is not acceptable anymore. Now, why would you get a triple hamburger without triple cheese? Why would you drink decaf when you can have the real thing? Okay, so you get, you, 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 why would, why, after you've, t you've touched our Armani suit, why would you want to buy tough skins from Sears? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Because you've touched, you already know what the real is like. When I hugged Herb Kelleher, I got the President's Award when I was there for 18 years, I got the President's Award and he hugged me. And he started Southwest Airlines with three airplanes. When I retired, he had like 1,100. When I hugged him, 
he said, thank you, and he gave me an award. And I felt his suit. I'm like, I mean, this guy is very wealthy. I mean, he had like, I don't know how many shares of Southwest stock when he retired. And I remember that, and I'm like, nothing else is acceptable anymore. In fact, I think I'm gonna take this one off right now. But do you see what I'm saying? You tasted, you tasted of the good and the real. And see, you tasted of the heavenly gift, the Holy Spirit. And your spirit is ignited and alive unto God. And you're trying to deal with, with things that happened in your childhood, why people that you trusted did what they did, why your friends betrayed you, why, why people are speaking against you, and, and all you do is love people, and you care about people. And you would, if they, and you, you know, and like the Lord told me, if people knew you, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, hate you. If they really knew you, they wouldn't hate you. But see, when I met Jesus, he's talking to me, and he's, there was no social distancing. So he was within, he was closer than six feet, and he didn't have a mask on. And he didn't say, hey, Jack, six feet, you know, no. He let, we were talking. But when we were talking, I, I was looking at him. I was watching him and looking in his eyes. And I looked at his beard. And I looked at his hairline in that three feet of hair. I just wanted one more inch of his. He had three feet. And I was looking at how perfect he was. You know, the, the father had taken away his scars on his face and his back. And, and uh, he didn't have those markings because he was beaten to where he wasn't recognizable. And yet, he was the most beautiful person I've ever met. He's the kindest person I've ever met. But I knew that he had destroyed my enemies by the cross. He had made a show of them openly. He had destroyed the works of the devil. And I knew that there were people that did not have the experiential knowledge of that. They were still dealing with the trauma of this fallen world. And so I know, like I would never mistreat you. I would never speak against you. I would never waste my Saturday afternoon writing bad things on your YouTube channel. I would never, like, I don't even do that with Satanists. I don't go to their website and say, you're going to hell. They already know they're going to hell. They're happy about it. But I'm not going to waste, I'm not going to do that to anybody. Because I love people. Okay, I looked at Jesus, and I thought as he's talking to me, who would ever pluck his beard out? Who would ever slap him? He is the kindest person I've ever met, and he loves people. Every person he designed. He thought, and, and then he let me talk, and I was talking. And then he was doing the same thing to me. I was watching him as I was talking. He was like marveling and just smiling at me, and he's kind of like doing his head like this. And all of a sudden, he interrupts me. Are you ready for this? And he says, I remember the day I thought of you. And he said, you turned out just like I thought. He said, you turned out just fine. And I melted. He let me go inside of him. And I saw him forming me inside of him. And then he spoke me out. I came out from from a, th a thought that became a reality inside of him that was hidden in him. And then he breathed me out and I went to my mother's womb. And, and he had already written a book about me. And he was marveling at what he had created as I stood before him. And I realized, I realized that this whole thing to him is not a, a really long time. This whole thing, this everything. And 
I was, it was, everything is so complicated down here. And I had to stop trying to figure things out and let Jesus at, at the opportune time, which could be this service, to explain things to me and why things happened. Why? But what I found was he doesn't stop everything. There's a permissive will. There's actually a permissive sense in the Hebrew that's tra it's not really transferred. Uh, you know, if you, if, you're, if you do these studies, there is a permissive sense to God. Where in the Hebrew thought, they thought, okay, if God allowed it, then it must be his will. But then we know that's not true. But there is this permissive will where there's a permissive sense where God didn't do anything about it. But that doesn't mean he did it. But see, in the Hebrew thought, they trusted God, but yet they didn't understand redemption. Abraham understood faith, but you understand that the people didn't understand when they were in the desert, they didn't understand several things. They missed some things. When, when Jesus came, they missed some things with him because they didn't discern their visitation. They didn't discern in the desert what that was all about, that it, it should have been a two-week tour not 40 days, or I mean 40 years. But they didn't enter into the promised land because of their unbelief, according to the book of Hebrews, which then makes it responsible for you because Hebrews brings that story into the New Testament and says, don't be like them who fell in the desert because of their unbelief. Okay, so the problem is, is that there's a wrench in the gear because you haven't been able to process what has happened to you because why did God let that happen? But to some people that understand the covenant, even if those people did not encounter God relationally. They did not go up to the mountain when they were asked to, and God got upset because he wanted to meet with the people. He wanted them to thank him personally for his faithfulness to Abraham and Joseph and promised to bring them out. And they, he did, and he, he invited them up to the mountain. They wouldn't come. They threw Moses under the bus. They said, you go up, whatever he says we'll do. But they didn't think he was coming back because the mountain's on fire. So they're, they're secretly thinking he's not coming back, which is, explains the golden calf and all the weird stuff. They threw him under the bus. Okay, but God was upset, right? Because he wanted relationship. So you can't deal just with God, with just with position. You can't just, it's just, so, so the covenant is awesome. And, the, and they understood the covenant. They weren't sick. They weren't poor. Their clothes didn't wear out because, you know, the Jew Jewish people, you don't have to explain that to them. They don't pray for money. They don't ask God for money. Because why? They're the sons of Abraham. They're under the Abrahamic blessing. So Jewish people are surprised when they don't make money. And so that's why... They get it for wholesale, and they sell it to the Gentile for retail. Because to them, retail is meant for the Gentiles. Wholesale is for the Jews. They automatically think covenant, okay? But relationship is what Jesus was seeking. He said, how I long to, to gather you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not have it. It was the stiff-necked, rebellious spirit that was in the desert that caused them to die. It was 
was what caused Jesus to be turned over by the religious organization to the Roman government. It was the same spirit. It was rebellion. They didn't accept him. He said, you didn't discern your day of visitation. He said that right before he went to the cross. Okay, so if you discern his visitation, even Job says that, that, that his visitation re, re, uh, uh, restores his spirit. That's me and uh, Pastor Wayne's favorite verse. 10, 12, Job. So the visitation of his spirit renews or restores your spirit. Okay, that's relational. So that's why God will come and it'll seem random, but there is no randomness. But God will come. Some will be set free. Some will not. And what it has to do with is you resolving in your heart that God is good. He's a good God, and that his goodness, the revelation of his goodness, leads us to repentance. Now, if you check it out, if you check out the disciples, they did not preach the way that people preach today. Paul said it, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. He didn't say the fear of hell or the fear of flames or eternal torment will lead people to repentance, okay? This is something that's very deep. You're actually probably going to be surprised that I could actually think this way. But I'm still a pert, not an expert. But listen to me. Listen to me closely. Because the way people come to the Lord really sets you on a path. And if it's not resolved, you never get into the relationship. You stay in the position. So if you got saved so you wouldn't go to hell, well then, congratulations, you got your ticket to heaven. But then, it, 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 no, 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 well, listen, hear me out, because I, 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 I had to deal with 800 people a day for 30 years. I listened to people. I talked to people. I, I realized that how people come in, how they, ha how they experience conversion, is how they act, they treat God the rest of their life, and unless a transformation happens, where there's an overthrow of the soul. So if you came to the Lord because of fear of being in hell, then you, you spend the rest of your life waiting for Jesus to come back on a white horse. And all you buy is DVDs on Armageddon and the book of Revelation, and you, you feed on that constantly. And every person that comes into leadership is the Antichrist. And you're storing up, you do, no, I'm serious, because you're feeding on that. But see, the problem is this. You came to Christ because you didn't want to go to hell, which is really a good thing. However, and hear me out, think about yourself, think about people you know. They, People then are waiting for something to happen. But see, Paul told the Thessalonians, he said, listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. He said, because they were quitting their jobs because Jesus was coming back. And he's saying, he explains to them, this is when Jesus is coming back. When this, this, and this, and he explains the whole thing. And he says, actually, He's being held back. The Antichrist is being held back right now. And you know who that is. That's what he says. And it's not going to happen until this, this, and this happens. So every generation since 60 AD gets their DVDs, you know. And they, they're like, which bowl of wrath are we on now? And if you, if you study, you can see this has happened over all... There's this cycle that happens, but see, 
Satan pushes his position every, every generation because he doesn't know if it's time yet. But he's a horse in the starting gates kicking. He just wants to do his thing. And he, he's overstepped his bounds so many times that the Antichrist that he was grooming, that is, you know, you can calculate his name. There's been so many of them that, ha- that add up to 666. It's, it's, it's a whole book in itself. Some of me don't even have birth certificates. And, and it never happens because it's not time. Smith Wigglesworth told Lester Sumrall, who was staying with him, being mentored by him, he said, the Nazis are coming, and I, you know, you're going to have to go back to the United States. I'm going to stay. It looked like it was the end. But, you know, World War II came and went. So relationship causes you to compel people to come in, to tell people good news, which is the gospel, which causes them to repent. The goodness of God leads people to repentance. The gospel means good news. Jesus went around doing good and healing everyone that was oppressed by God. No, the devil. That right there, if you didn't have anything else, if you had that one verse, you could make it through life. Because it gives you everything you need. Did you know that? Acts 10.38? Three by five card, a summary of your life. That's your assignment. You go around doing good and healing everyone that's oppressed of the devil. That's what Jesus did. He he only did what his father did, right? Okay. Jesus' ministry was his relationship with his father. It was not his occupation. Everything he did was his father doing it through him. It wasn't his occupation. It wasn't position. It was beyond that. So Jewish people operate under a covenant, but have no relationship like we do. Right? But how many believers, because of not being able to reconcile with things that have happened, they are we're at a standstill in our relationship, right? So, you know, like, like when I worked, worked for Southwest Airlines, Herb Kelleher didn't call me every night and ask how things were going. No, I had my assignment and I did it. But you know what's interesting? In, when he would see me, he would remember my name and he would ask me, What can we do to make your job better? How can we serve the people better? Is there anything you're seeing that the the passenger is not getting their needs met? What can we do? He would go down and help the guys throw bags when he was on my flight. He'd disappear and I'd see him down there throwing bags onto the airplane. Then he would serve my snacks on my airplane for me. He said, you just take care. He would go by and shake everybody's hand. And he could fly a private jet. He said to me, he said, the secret here is I want permanent customers. He says, I want them to come back, Kevin. I don't want them just to come. I want them permanently. He said, so on the airplane, you resolve it. It costs $75 to respond to a bad letter. But if you take care of it on the airplane, you can give them a free drink and it costs 35 cents. Or... You can let them 
go the whole way with it, and we know it's not your fault, but you know they're going to get, it's going to cost us 75 bucks, and then we're going to give them a voucher. And he, he said, he said this, he said, America West Airlines, they were mad because we had dropped our fares to $29. And the guy was on TV, like, mad at Herb Kelly. He says, you're trying to put us out of business. He goes, I'm not competing against you. Herb said, I'm competing against the car. He says, so we're going to nine bucks. He went to 19 and then nine. And I realized that when I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, when I've tasted of the powers of the coming age, when I've encountered the goodness of God, when I've encountered the power of the blood and the power of the name, I realized that my relationship was going to take me beyond what I can do on my own. Whereas my position... without relationship, that there was no fulfillment in that. And there was unresolved issues with me because I wondered why things were allowed to happen. And then I found out this. Jesus told me, he said, well, I had no part of that, and you never invited me into that situation. And this is what he said. It was really hard. He told me to write a book called Supernatural Finances. I had to write it. I actually called the publisher and said, put this book on hold. This one's got to go in right now. I go, yeah, but, you know, I go, well, they go, it has to be done in 30 days, and there's no way you can do that. I go, it's done. Start counting. So I wrote it in 30 days, put it in, and published it. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, he said my people, my people will not let me into their finances. And he said, it's obvious. And I saw that the Jewish old covenant was, okay, you work it this way. You do this, you obey this, you, you know, you know, and the Pharisees, they were so proud of themselves, you know, walk around with all the formality of, you know, I pray, I gave this, you know, they make it, they make it so it would sound, the sound of the money would drop and make a noise. And they, they wore all their, their garb, you know, and they were holy men. And Jesus said, You'll go, twi- you'll go around the world, you'll go halfway around the world to find a convert. When you, you find one, you make him twice the son of hell that you are, is what he said. In any language, it says that, twice the son of hell that you are. Paul thought he was, Saul thought he was doing God's work. P- Jesus told his disciples, there's coming a day when people will kill you thinking they're doing God's work or God's favor. And that's what Saul did. But see, Paul, when he was converted, he said, I was called as an apostle since birth. And I've wronged no man. I found, ladies and gentlemen, I found, because you're my family, I found that I was working against God because I didn't know God. That's why I was working against him. But I didn't know I was working against him. Paul, Saul didn't think he was working against God until he met the Lord. And he found out that if you're persecuting the children, you're persecuting him. Whatever you do to those little ones, you're doing to Jesus. So I saw that I was working against myself. Because I hadn't processed things, because I blamed God. And when I was in heaven, I saw that it was not his fault. That he was uninvited because of lack of understanding. And I see this all the time. You see... If I say what the covenant says, if I say what my relationship says, it offends people. Because it sounds arrogant, it sounds bold. But I'm not gonna die of any disease, whether it's pandemic or scamdemic or anything. (laughs) It doesn't matter. Because, because my world, no listen, listen, I know, thank you. But my world, my world is framed by Psalms 91. 
But see, Psalms 91 is not a covenant to me. Even though we, 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 have, we have covenant, we have blood covenant. Psalms 91 is relationship to me. Because if I make the most high, I, if you make the most high your dwelling place. It doesn't say visitation. It doesn't say encounter. It says dwelling. It's, a, it's habitation. If you make the most high your dwelling place, if you, if you turn, if Amazon delivers to the secret place, that's where you live. Okay? Right? That's your dwelling place. Then none of these things are going to touch you. And I watched 1,000 fall and 10,000 at my right hand, but it didn't come near me. But it, it bothered me that I lost friends. I mean, it bothers me. It bothers me then in fear they get poked in the arm. When what they need is a, 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 they need a, a boost in their immunity. Because that's what it is. It, it preys on weakness. Sounds like the enemy to me. I mean, if you watch the lions, if you watch the lions, they, they, don't, they don't want the fastest gazelle. They just want the slowest. When we were, before, before I preached, we, we went to South Africa, and it's like 25-hour flight, so two flights. We had to go to Dubai. Those devils are still talking about me and my wife being there. We prayed in tongues for four hours on our ground time, and I know those devils haven't gotten over that yet. I mean, we prayed in tongues. We went, we went into the executive lounge. We ate their food. We, we prayed in tongues. They were like, please get on the plane and leave. And now we're going to go back and do, uh, we're going to do a meeting there. But then when we got there, we went on a safari. And it was interesting, you know, a whole week there, every day, staying right there. And, you know, having electric fences around us and, you know, and people with rifles. And, and we were out and about, and I, I, we got to see a lion. But before I saw him, I felt him. And this is what happened. All of a sudden... There was no wildlife. There was no birds singing. Nothing. Nothing. And then the lion appeared. And when he, I looked into his eyes, and he just came up behind us, and we just kept going, and he kept walking. And he just, like, looked to his side, looked this way. No one challenged him. No one touched him. He, he walked as though he owned the place, because he did. Okay, he didn't have to say a thing, and he was probably within 20, 30 feet of us. And we just kept moving, and he kept walking. And I looked into his eyes, and he's, you know, I would say from here to, to row four. And I looked into his eyes, and there was no fear. There was no inhibition. There was nothing from this realm that, you would, that we all encounter. He owned the place. And everybody knew it. It was just so interesting that he was there, but you couldn't see him. But the manifestation of his presence had already shifted the whole safari. You could feel it. And when I looked into his eyes, there was no fear. That's what I saw in Jesus' eyes. But, you know, when, I, when we were looking at houses, Kathy wanted this one house, and um, I went to the backyard and started praying in tongues. And I walked up on a gator. So I've already decided this is not our house, but... <laughs> It's amazing. The, the alligators, they'll look at you and they size you up. And they, th they, they determine if they can take you or not. And if they start to back up, then they, they've determined that they can't take you. So I, I kind of like lifted my chest to make it, you know. 
little more fluffy, but he backed off, and he just showed himself out. But if he was a little bigger, he wouldn't have. And I started to see something about myself. My relationship with God will take me further than even my own understanding. And that faith, really, faith is trust. And if you look at, because I've done this, I don't know how to say this, so please forgive me. But to me, faith is, I don't have to believe. I have it. It's beyond belief. Please don't take that wrong. I know that I know that I know. That's how angels are. Every time I've encountered an angel, there's never like, uh, you know, excuse me, can I talk to you for a second? No, you're like face down and like, thus saith the Lord. And if you're, you're like thinking, can I just crawl out of here? No, there's like, no, you know, I know it's going to be a hard message, so I'm sorry. No, they don't apologize. They let it fly. Right? Okay. The things that I encounter on the other side were like that. The word of God to me, I encounter the word of God that way. So if God has determined this is the way it is, then I, I, don't, I don't put in an amendment request. I don't see if I can stack. I'm not going to say all those words, but I'm not going to stack the people that represent me. I'm not going to stack the judicial system so that it favors. No, you can't, you can't amend it. Because... Absolute truth is higher than facts. Now, no, hear what I'm saying because I'm trying to show you something here, what faith is. Faith is not facts. Faith is absolute truth that is part of the layers of God's throne. In Psalms 89, there are layers in his throne. One of them is righteousness and justice. And he sits on that throne and makes judgments, and that's it. He doesn't invite you to discuss it. He's done that and wrote a book about you before you were born, and he didn't even invite you to that meeting. He doesn't have a suggestion box. He gave the seraphim six wings. He never asked us. He doesn't care if we know why. But see, we're, we're, we're still bothered why, why God let the anointed cherub that covers Eden, why he let him do what he did. But see, trust would have said, why am I talking to a serpent about theology? When God is coming down like he does every day and walking with me, I could talk to him. I don't need to be talking to him. So was it God's fault? You see, what happened there is beyond our understanding, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you anyway, and you're going to like it. <laughs> Brought you here to have a good time. You're going to have a good time. Like, like, like Guido says, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. There are certain things about God that are not amendable. The relationship that Adam and Eve had did not require any other conversation about it because God was not keeping anything from them. He was protecting them. The tree was placed in a garden so that man and woman who were so close to being God that they had to be reminded that they were not. So a tree was placed, the tithe, it was God's. It was not theirs. It was never theirs. That tree was never theirs, just like the tenth is not yours. It was never yours. It's a test. 
we need to take an intermission because you're going to take an, at least a year to think about what I just said. But the tree was placed there, and God ate from it in front of them. He did that whole thing because we were created like him. And because we weren't God, we were an image, we would think that we were God, especially if we hang out with him. So there had to be a check and balance to remind us. We cannot handle knowing evil. We can't handle that. God can. God can sit and watch it and not change. It doesn't, he's not tempted. But we, if we have a choice, we can't make the right choice. The USB port is the perfect example of that. There's only two ways it fits. But I guarantee you try three times before you get it. That is mathematically impossible. <laughs> Try it. They, they were developing algorithms for trading platforms. And it's really about, it's all algorithms. It's all, it's all appears to be random, but it's really not. That's why you should never go to Vegas, unless you just want to eat their free food. And then you win. But see, it's set up so that you don't win. But someone will. But they've already made millions between. Because it's all set up. Okay, so it's set up that way. So they, what they did was they proved, they proved the, 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 the trading platforms, like, like a Wall Street. They Instead of picking stocks, they literally taught a monkey to throw darts at a Wall Street Journal section where all the stocks are listed. Just massive amounts of stocks. They put it on the wall and they had a monkey throw darts at it. They took those stocks that it landed on, where the, the point was, and they invested in that, and it did better than the professionals. He went to space. He went to space, went to orbit. No, no, no the, I'm trying to show you something here. You don't want, there is no randomness. You see, you have to come in line and get healed. And allow yourself to accept the fact that God walked by Moses in the cleft of the rock and revealed himself to him. But Moses barely lived through it. And when he asked, when he kept, because he was having this conversation, you know, God, when in the conversations, you don't pick it up unless you really study. You have to study Exodus. You have to start and read all those chapters in the 20s and up to 32. You have to read Exodus, and you have to really do word studies. Because what happens is, is as God's talking to Moses, Moses notices that God starts calling the people Moses' people instead of his people. And Moses catches it. He goes, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, you're not going to put this on me. If, if, if you don't go with us, we're not going. Because he knew, he knew, he understood what, God, I understand you're having a bad day, but you can't kill them. So he said, I can't be among them. I can't hang out with them in the green room. He said, so Moses had to like say, well, you can't kill them because then, he said, well, I just want to make you a nation. I'll make you a nation. Well, they all ended up dying anyway, right? But he said, okay, I'll send an angel, but he won't tolerate their sin either. And of course he didn't, they all fell dead. Okay. Then God said a profound thing. Are you ready to catch this? He said, Moses, we're fine. My presence shall go with you. 
we're fine. But he used the word presence, which this is going to flip you out, and all you scholars, you'll know what I'm talking about. There is no word for presence. The word is, is actually panaim, which it should be panai, but it's plural. It's faces instead of face. My faces shall go with you. Panaim. Not panai, my panai shall go with you. The idea is, is that God is looking toward us. We've caught his attention. If he smiles, his glory comes from his face, and we have favor. Can you, can you, let's just go right now. We, we can break. I'm about ready to have a breakdown here in the glory. Okay. If you catch God's attention because of faith, like the centurion, now, let's be honest with us. Jesus said, there, I haven't seen this in Israel. He said, this great of faith. He marveled, okay? But what did the centurion equate faith to? Understanding authority. So if Jesus says it, I got it. I'm not going to pray amiss because I'm praying out the mysteries in the Spirit. I'm not going to ask amiss because the Spirit's not going to work against himself. But as that reality comes up in me, I catch the attention of God with my faith because it's formed within me and I got it. And then my words match what's inside of me and it comes to me. I don't even have to leave my house. I don't have to beg. That's why I give things away instead of charge. Because I'm being chased down right now by goodness and mercy. I'm being tackled from behind. I've been sacked. I've fallen and I can't get up. Because I'm overcome by his goodness. It was that wave that got me from behind. I didn't see it coming. But you know what? It's very predictable. Moses said, no, not panaim, kabod. I want to see your kabod. See, nobody catches that. I want to see your glory. And God said, you want to die? You can't see my face and live. Why? Because I can look at Jesus all day in the presence, but I guarantee you, if he walks into that Father's glory, I can't look at his face. I couldn't look at the Father's face. The Lord Jesus wouldn't let me. He said, you cannot see the Father's face because you wouldn't be able to return to your body. Your body's fallen. It would not handle your spirit seeing your face of your Father. I cannot live in my body if I see the face of my Father. So I wasn't allowed to see his face because I wouldn't be here talking to you. But there was only one time that Jesus appeared to me and my roommate, walked into my room unannounced, and the glory was coming from his face, and the bed frames bent from the glory. We were pleading for our lives. We were repenting. As spirit-filled ministers, we were repenting of everything. I felt as though... It was easier to die than to live in that. But see, I can't say that in public, so I don't. Because everybody's like, what did he just say? I'm telling you, I, I've experienced this, the holiness of God, the, the glory of God, to where I was fearful. It wasn't that God loved me less. It's just that he always veils himself so that we can handle him. You think you've seen everything. You haven't seen nothing. You can't handle the truth. It's not just for Guantanamo Bay, you know. So God compromises to show a part of him that he doesn't show. And when he did that, now Moses 
is accountable. Now, when God says the second time, I want you to speak to the rock, he was held at a higher accountability because of the relationship. And Paul told the Corinthians that the rock followed the children of Israel in the desert and provided water. Paul says that, and he says that rock was Christ. Paul says that, okay? So, Hebrews says that once you have tasted of the heavenly gift and the powers of the coming age, to trample underfoot the blood of Jesus as an unholy thing, there is no repentance for sin. That's sin. You can't come back. It's unpardonable. Why? Because you can't strike Christ twice. He struck once, and then you speak to him the second time. You kiss the son lest he be angry. You get it right on the way with your accuser. You judge yourself lest you be judged. You can't put Christ up on the cross again. So Moses, being the law, will strike Christ again. But now we speak to the Son. He's been struck once. He cannot be crucified again. He will not come back and be crucified again, not even for aliens. He will never return and be crucified again for another race. Okay, so you want to see Jesus. You want to have angel visitation. You want to encounter the glory. Do you know what you're asking? Because then, which is going to happen, but you, you have to capture the Lord's his, his attention in the presence, and he has to smile at you and favor you, not in position, but in relationship. I'm not worried about if, whether I'm going to heaven or not. I want to take as many people with me as I possibly can, and I want to stay here as long as I can to give the devil a headache. I want to get in his way and stop him and prevent him. I want to be part of the, of the, the body that keeps him from manifesting the son of perdition. And so Moses had a relationship with God, and God took him further, but then Moses was held accountable, and at the end of his life, because he had struck the rock twice instead of speaking to it the second time like he was told, he was not allowed to enter because the law cannot enter the promised land. Moses can't take you in. Joshua can't. Joshua in, in, is, it's right there in the, in the Bible. It's amazing. Joshua's name is Jesus. Jesus. Joshua could take them in. The law could not. But Joshua had faith. He said, we can take this land. And him and Caleb had to spend the next 40 years with that bunch. Now, I want to show you something that you probably have not thought about. But Moses, because of that saturation of being with the Lord that many days, at least twice, 40 days, without food or water, his face had transformed back to the original Adam. By being that close to God, his face started to take on the person that he spent time with. And then when he went down, he did not know that his face was beaming. And this is without Hillsong and Bethel and earbuds and Andrew Walmack. He didn't have any of those things. But he had relationship, and he talked with God face to face. And something happened to him that caused his countenance to become 
like gods and like Adam and Eve before they fell. But he didn't know it because it became normal. When he came down, the people didn't think it was normal, and they were afraid of him. It says they were afraid. They said beams were coming out of his face. If you read some of the translations and do those studies, you'll find that he was being transfigured. Is this too much? I'll back off. Okay, so the people made him cover his face, and it wasn't because of a scamdemic. Okay, so, so he was being transformed in the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant could not resolve the sin problem, but it did delay it and teach us that, that we had a problem. That's what the law was for. That we, it shows the problem we have and the weakness, but it couldn't fulfill the righteous requirements that God had. It had to be through blood. Okay, now, now in the New Testament... Moses, I guarantee it, when he appeared with Elijah and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he did not know that he wasn't on Mount Sinai. Because Jesus is I am. And up there on that mountain, there was no time. Oh yeah, click, click, click. So God says it's time to die. Come with me, Moses. Full health, 120, nothing wrong with him, and God has to tell him to die because he won't die. Adam and Eve couldn't die until he took them out of the garden and stopped them eating from the tree of life. They would have lived forever in sin. He, he went, what? No, think about it. Outside the garden, God came to Cain and said, Hey, why are you downcast? He noticed his countenance was downcast. He said, Don't you know that if you do right, things are going to go well with you? But if not, sin is crouching at your temple door as a lion. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You must master it. Did I mention you must master it? God visited him face to face. Now listen to this, face to face in sin and coached him knowing full well what he's about to do because sin requires a sacrifice. And if, if Cain had done the right thing, Abel would still be alive. Not, not today, but you are, some say. Think about it. Blood has a voice. God heard Abel's voice crying out to him, the blood. Jesus' voice has a blood, has a vo Jesus' blood has a voice. It's speaking. Okay, so Moses dies before the Lord because God had already told him. And he had already made the announcement that he can't strive with man, their days shall be 120 years. This was because Men was, man was so evil that God couldn't put up with him any longer than that. But if you walk with God, why is it that in Iran, you can look it up. It's on the internet. It must be true. But there's paper clippings where people in Iran, Muslims, live to be 147. There's one that lived to be 151. Okay, they, mm, not the same. Okay. Do they eat more fiber or what? No. What's going on there, okay? I'm, I'm asking you this because I'm trying to show you something. God limited those, those to those years because he wouldn't strive with man. Because it says that their hearts were evil. They were wicked. All their thoughts and intents were wicked. So he put an end to it. So Moses lives to be 120, but he can't go into the promised land. So God takes him up and says, it's time to die. And Moses is like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> right? Okay. You've forced me to go further. 
New Testament. Peter, you know, Pastor Peter, Apostle Peter. Sunday afternoon, during the service, they're taking offerings. People were selling things so that they can support the church. It was growing, you know, it was like 5,000. I think at the time it was like two or 3,000 and it, would just, it was just going up, 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 up. Is this what you paid for it? Yeah. How dare you lie to the Holy Spirit? Boom. Okay, uh, cut the YouTube feed. We got a situation here. People's like, what just happened? Nothing here, keep walking. No, no, church service, offering, New Testament. Did I mention New Testament? Okay. Who killed them? <laughs> Look at everybody. <laughs> You see, I'm not afraid to ask the hard questions because that does not go away just because we ignore it. Even the nearly inspired version still has it in its Bible. Now, we got, 50, we got, we got 1,700, 1,800 signed up. We've got about 1,500, 1,400 here. If someone drops dead and their, their wife is still alive, how long do you think your Android will stay inactive or your Apple, if you dare to have an Apple? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> how long will they stay inactive before you text Safara and say, hey, you might want to get your story straight, <laughs> right? You start, a, you start a, like a, a, a group, a prayer group, and you like tag all your friends. If you see Safara, do not let her come to church without getting her story correct, that she did not pay that price for that property. Right? But it was hours later, she shows up, comes up. Peter doesn't, you know, being the loving pastor he is, he doesn't say, hey, can I talk to you a second? <laughs> what lack of love? <laughs> I mean, Peter wasn't walking in love. He didn't even help her. Is this what you paid for it? He's already motioning for the ushers to come <laughs> to gather the bodies up, you know? No, no, think about this. Is this, am I, have I stretched this at all? Okay, this is New Testament. This is before a tracks but it is New Testament. So, can you really, really get rid of some of the things about the personality of God just because, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. You get my point. So there's this part of, of Jesus when he walked into the room. My, my roommate started sp screaming like a little girl. And we hit the deck. Now, I'd had Jesus appear to me before, but not like this. I couldn't look at his face because the glory was coming out of his face. But in the presence, you can handle it. But when that glory comes from his face, you can't look at him. You can't look at the Father with that glory coming out of his face. But see, that's his normal. That's how we were made at one time. Adam and Eve could handle it. Even outside, after they sinned, God still came down to have fellowship with them. And wanted to know where they were. Who killed, who killed Ananias and Sapphira? Did they actually make the wrong decision and run into the wall? 
and kill themselves? If Moses would have said, you know what, God, I can handle it. Just go ahead. I want the full bore. I want the full platinum package. No veil. And he stands there like this. And he's telling Aaron, make sure you get this on film. No, he wouldn't be alive. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't have mattered, right? He wouldn't, we would never, we just wouldn't have known. He would never came back from the mountain. Okay, so there are certain things about God that we cannot handle. And he's God and we're not. So when you're in heaven, it never occurs to you on who made it and who didn't. You have no reference point. If someone did not make it to heaven, you have no reference point to look for them. It's not spoken. There was no way for me in heaven to go and access my past. The earth was a speck of dust that was a, in a history book that had dust on it. It is as though it was not real. I didn't think about my parents. I didn't think about the fact that I never got married or that I left that Kit Kat half eaten on my desk. <laughs> it didn't matter anymore. It was so far away, but yet the throne was so close. And my home was where I was. I was never part of this earth. I never fit in. I wasn't supposed to fit in. I was supposed to be a plumb line, a battle axe, a measuring rod, a anointed voice, which all of you are too. Why do we put this on the fivefold? The fivefold is called according to Scripture. If you want to bring the Bible into it, Paul said the fivefold is to build up the body in the maturity and unity until we reach maturity and unity. So I look at the responsibility of the fivefold. If we're not in unity and we're not mature, well, then we know what's going on. So that's why I am called to build up the body. So I don't have anything bad to say to you. I have no criticism for you. I just have truth. But see, my, the truth that I'm giving you is absolute truth from heaven. It's not facts. You know, I don't care if you change the color of your hair. At least you have hair. I'm not going to criticize you. I don't care if you walk backwards with a hot potato in your pocket to keep warm in snow or if you flew here. It doesn't matter. You are obedient to come. I'm not going to criticize you for what you wear. I'm glad you have something on. <laughs> but I'm not going to criticize you in any of that. If, but the thing of it is, is that what is important, though, is that we all agree. And everything that is in Scripture, we should agree upon. And it's really... There are not 29 interpretations of Jesus in a small town. So we, we resolved it. I, told, I called him. I said, I said, the Lord's going to put you on the head of that board for that because they all meet on a forum. All pastors meet, have breakfast. And so I prayed. I said, this is what the Lord wants. So thus saith Lord, this is his desire. If this is the way it's going to be, then I want him on the board as the head of all those. And I want him to have preference in the prisons. Not some guy who's going to put feathers, chicken blood on you. You know what I'm saying. So because he is in charge, then what happens is 
the bar is risen to the place of not facts, but truth. And then everyone should get a dose of that truth and make a decision on if they're going to embrace Jesus on that level. And if not, they'll just be judged for that. Everybody's judged according to what they know. But God gives you the, the chance to know and then allows you to make the decision. So the things that you go through in your life, it's really about what you understood at the time and what you did not understand. You, whatever you permitted was allowed. Now this, I, I share this with you just because it just happened, but this stuff happens every day, is that to me the reality is Psalms 91. But see, I didn't get there overnight. I have scars to prove that I was not in the secret place. But there had to come that time where I got smart. And I thought, you know what? I might not want to do that again. I made a judgment based on truth, not on facts. I didn't think, well, you know, maybe I can get away with it again. Well, it's a risk. But what if there was no risk? What if believing what God has already said, what if that's real faith? What if it's trust that there's a higher level of reality, which Paul talks about to the uh, Colossians in chapter 3. He said, set your sights or your affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Which, with, with, that is the place that you're supposed to set yourself, your, your, your vision and your emotions, everything, your passion is set there. Not on earthly things, Paul says. So Jesus told me that most people are so carnally minded that they're no earthly good. And the devil used to tell me through people that I'm so spiritually minded I'm no earthly good. But every generation rejects the voice for that generation. But then they celebrate him as a hero in the next. But they kill them. Jesus said, I sent people to you. And you killed them. He said, you're going to do the same to me. He said, you celebrate them as your heroes, but you killed them. That's exactly what he said. So being a friend of God is knowing that you're not going to fit in because that's your job. That's your calling. So God's personality starts to rub off on you, and then people don't like you. They didn't like Moses. They didn't like Paul. I know that most churches couldn't handle Paul. I know most churches couldn't handle Jesus showing up and preaching. Because one circle say, well, just show us a miracle. One would say, you know, we need fed. Make some bread and some, and some fish. You, know, you got others are like, you know, can you just talk to us about finances? Can you just talk to us about marriage? He's going to say, before marriage was, I am. And you realize, wait a minute, he's talking from another realm because he is another realm. He didn't come from another realm. He is a realm. He's a level of reality that causes us to get over ourselves. And then all of a sudden, we can't remember what was bothering us. I don't blame my parents. I don't blame my teachers. I don't blame anyone for where I am. I stopped blaming everyone, and I said, Lord, if, 
if Chase Bank knows where I am in the world because of the chip in my card, then you do too. They wouldn't pay my employees while we were in France because we're supposed to be in Switzerland. But they didn't have any hotels because we were, in, we were in Geneva and they were having the UN meeting there. So we had to go to France to get a hotel and then come back every meeting. And so my wife is buying me a suit in France while I'm trying to pay my employees. And they blocked it. So I called them and I go, hey, do you see how many commas and zeros are in my account? What are you doing? Do you want to lose me? I need to pay my employees. Well, Mr. Zeta, you know, you're, you're in France. I go, oh, so you know where I'm at. Oh, yeah, Mr. Zeta, your wife is at this store. She's, she purchased this, and then here you are in another country, and you just did this, and so there's a discrepancy. No discrepancy. We're, it's cleared up right now. Oh, no, it's not that easy. And it went on and on. It went on for four hours. I finally had to call my local bank, and they hung up on me. Not because I was rude. It was just like... Can you just call them and tell them, well, we need your driver's license. You, I said, you already have that. How do we know this is you? You knew I was in France. <laughs> okay, so God, so God knows where we're at. And with, so he can locate you right now and walk you out of the woods. But what you have to do is this. You have to let go of the hurt of the past and the discrepancy of what happened to you. You know, I, I find out, when I find out what happens to people, you know, I find out what's, being, what's, what's going on in people's lives that are my friends or my family, and I find out what people have done to them. I go, I just need an address, and just turn the other way. I just want to take care of it. The things that people have done to my wife before I met her. It just saves the court some money. Why? Because I want people to be treated right. Okay, so don't you think that your Heavenly Father wants that? Okay, don't you think He wants you to prosper to where you have more than enough that you can help others? Okay, so why would you resist Him in trying to help you? It's because you're damaged. You're hurt. Because this is a broken world. So as we close this session, I want you to resolve in your heart that we were not made to operate in a broken world. We're very, very finely and intricately made, like I've said. And because of that, we don't function with delay or discrepancy or disappointment or discouragement. We, we only know in our spirit courage and appointments. We know that when we pray, there is no, there is no time. God has heard our prayer, and he's, he's working right now. But we expect it. We expect it. Because our spirits are made like God, and God keeps his word. But then when things don't happen, when people, people are stealing, killing, and destroying, and you're misrepresented, you're, you're all misrepresented. And there are people that are representing you that really aren't representing you. And things are stolen, and you just stand there thinking, there's no place like home. And you're clicking your heels thinking it's all going to go away. But see, that's what the devil does. He steals, kills, and destroys. But Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So you wonder when the justice is going to come. You wonder when the recompense, the, when, it, when it turns. You're in your spirit, you're grieved because there's a, there's a discrepancy on what you know in your spirit is right and what's really happening. And it's hard to deal with that. I, I even have trouble breathing every day. I don't watch the Chinese network, news network. I can't quote any of those people on what they're saying because there's a higher level that's being spoken from heaven. I'm setting my affections on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And I only hear my commander. I only hear my shepherd, okay? He's speaking healing to me. So getting back to what I didn't finish on the soccer thing. Remember the soccer team? So 
the Bulls, you know, they're doing their thing. It, it, the score is like three to one. I'm keeping track of every time they hit my door with the ball. Okay. So I put my headsets in because if I am delayed eight hours, I don't get to fly with my crew. I don't get home when I'm supposed to because I don't have enough rest. So I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to suffer tomorrow. But I thought if I put my headsets in and listen to the Word of God, I put it on the book of Hebrews, and I listen to that over and over again for years now. I put it and I listen to Hebrews and Ephesians and Colossians over and over, and the book of John over and over again. Never the book of Revelation. <laughs> because I'm actually preventing that from happening. I'm in chapter 3 where it talks about lukewarmness in chapter 2. That's where I, I'm, I'm camped right now because Jesus told me he's done with lukewarmness. He appeared to me and said he's done with lukewarmness last May. He said the church is not ready for what's about to happen. They're not going to pass their test. So you need to warn them. This is what my will is, but if they don't repent and pray for this nation, it's not going to happen. Well, that went over well, and it's going over well now. Not. But see, the thing of it is, it was all up to the church. Kenneth Hagin, before he died, he said, if anything bad happens to America, it's the church's fault. It's interesting because I always wanted to meet Billy Brim. And one day, she, was, she told someone to give her, her number to me. So I waited three months, prayed, and then the Lord said, call her. And when I called her, my whole life changed. Because she's the one that wrote Brother Hagin's books. Helped him write. She knew him very well. And we had a conversation, me and my wife, for about two hours, not that long ago, like a month, a month or two ago. Changed my life. I've always wanted to meet her but I wasn't going to do anything about it. But I found out some things through that conversation that gave me understanding that I wouldn't have gotten unless I had had the other side of Brother Hagen, the other side of her. And you know why that happened? You know why that all happened? Because one day at a church that we were attending, she, was, she had spoken. And we were leaving down through the atrium the other way. She was down there, and they had left her alone. She was standing there alone waiting for her ride. No one was there to attend to her. And I told the Lord at that point, if I ever have a ministry, a minister that comes is going to be taken care of. They will never be left alone. I will put, and that's, if you come and speak for me, if you come to my studios, you have a person assigned to you 24 hours a day to make sure that you're, because of her. But see, I, so, I, I said that because of what happened, and I got to meet her. But she changed my life by what she said. I got it back. And this is what happened. I fell asleep in that hotel. It sounds random, but I'm, I'm pulling stones out of your soil. That soccer team, I couldn't hear them anymore. I could hear the word of God. And I fell asleep. At midnight, I woke up, and I can hear someone talking. And I thought, they're still up? And there was someone in my room. I go, there's not somebody in my room. So I took my headset off. And I could hear, I'm half asleep, I could hear someone speaking very loudly in my room. So I'm looking around and I turned a light on. There's no one there. There's no one in the hallway. And I realized that it was coming out of my mouth. And I, the Lord said, don't get up here, let it go. So for an hour and 10 minutes, I timed it. It says, watch and pray. I prophesied. The spirit was talking about Kevin. The Spirit was talking, and you'd be jealous if you heard what he was saying. He, he, the Spirit of God, this is before, when I was just a stewardess. 
being abused by a soccer team. I thought someone was in my room and it was my voice, but because I had the headsets on, I didn't know that, my, that it was coming out of my spirit and I was speaking at the top of my lungs. When I pulled it off, I heard out of my own mouth, Kevin shall succeed in his mission. He shall go throughout the earth as a flame of fire, lighting fires everywhere he goes, and no one will be able to stop him. Because I have placed my anointing on him, and he has my word in him, and there's nothing that's going to stop him. He will not fail. And it went on for an hour and a half. Okay? This is what's going on inside of you all the time. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, because I'm no more special than you are. I just passed my test. Once you pass your test, you're going to be up here, and I'm going to be sitting there listening to you. And I'll be glad for it. I'm tired. I want to go back to work so I can rest. <laughs> I heard the Spirit say so many beautiful things about me, and I realized that I was formed and fashioned intricately. I was fearfully and wonderfully made, and God was speaking things through His Spirit about me through me. And I didn't know it. It happened by accident. I, I stumbled into it. And I realized if I can prophesy like this all the time, I would just say what the tension of the Lord is. And if people mix it with faith, it'll happen. But see, prophecy in the New Testament is conditional. That's a quote from Brother Hagin. You have to mix it with faith. We're in the New Testament now. Malachi is retired. Okay, now all that word is still the word of God. It shall not pass away. However, there's better promises and a better covenant. And in the New Testament, you mix with faith the word of God. Or it doesn't happen. You know, many of the fathers that would, I could name Finney and, and all, all the, you know, the, the, the Methodist brothers, you know. They, they notice it seems like God only moves when people pray. And think about this. The, past, the pastor in Texas during the oil field days, he would tell people, listen, you got to obey the safety regulations at your job. Because people were saying in his church, man, God's taken a lot of people this year. So he told them, he said, listen, if it says, don't touch this when your feet are wet, then you might not want to do that. And, and, and they don't touch that red knob. Don't be like a little kid. That's the first thing they do if you tell them not to. And this is what the pastor said to Brother Hagin. He said it was amazing how God didn't take as many people the next year when they followed the safety regulations. <laughs> So the Spirit's saying things that are way too good for you to have, to have in your mind right now. That's exceedingly above. But he's saying them to you. And I had only done 35% of what God had slated for me to do when I went to heaven. I had an audit as I stood before him. And he said, well done. When he said, well done, poof, everything flashed before me everything in my life. Everything went I saw all the opportunities that were there that I didn't discern, what I could have done and I didn't, and I received rewards for 35% of that. And I said to the Lord, I would have done so much more for you if I would have known. And the fact was, I could have known. But I didn't dig deep into the word. I didn't discern it was habitation. It was where I dwelt. Nothing could harm me. Angels are assigned with special assignments 
to keep me in all my ways. Arrows are going to fly, demonic arrows by day and by night. But there'll be people dropping thousand at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. And so my, my, it's not that I'm better than anyone else. I, I, think, I think I'm just more aware of what we all have. But I don't like to do this alone. We're all the body. There ha if Moses had to be told to die, then what about us in the New Testament? It's so much higher than what we're living at. At what point do you all see disease stop and don't come into your house? When do you see tumors just drop off your body? Because there has to come that point where nothing is impossible. Okay, well, all I want is 300 people that know how to drink water in war. I just want 300 Gideon army that, that make sure they're looking what they're drinking. I just need 300 sober-minded people. At what point do you go into this place called the secret place and you live there, you throw away the key. I'm telling you, my wife knows this. My staff knows this. They see miracles every day. I don't talk about it. But I think about what just happened. One of my staff members, he watched it happen at his house. I'm walking because I have to go to the restroom, so you know I gotta go pretty bad. So I'm not walking at a short, a soft pace. And I look, and that, that sliding glass door is open. But it's not open. It's just really clean. <laughs> and I'm walking up. He watched it happen. And I heard the audible voice of God say, stop now and turn to your left. And that's why my nose is still on my face. I kid you not. And he, and he'll, he could come up here. He's very busy right now, but he could come up here and testify. He came up to me. He goes, the Lord just spared you. I watched the whole thing happen. He said, he spoke to you, didn't you? You were about to plow into that. I go, yeah. But see, I've learned. I don't like argue with him. Why? Why do I have to stop? I got to go to the bathroom. Okay, it's relationship. It's trust. The Lord told me one day when $50,000 was a whole year's salary, he told me, give $50,000 to someone who didn't even like me. I said, well, okay, I'll do it if you tell my wife. So I said, hey, Kathy. I said, she was on the treadmill. I said, pray about this. You know, how much? I didn't tell her how much. I said, you know, this, this person. So she prays in tongues, and she's doing her treadmill, and she gets off. She goes, yeah, you're supposed to get $50,000. <laughs> A whole year's wages. So I did it. See, I passed my $50,000 test. That person thinks I hear from God now. I started out with a dollar. And the Lord built me up. Do you know how many people... They started out in the healing ministry, and the people they prayed for died. That didn't stop them, because they're not the healer. They're the one that prays. We lay hands on the sick. He recovers them. We, we cast out devils. They leave. But they see who's behind us. That's who they're afraid of. The, the disease has to go. It can't resist Jesus. At what point do we get there? Do you, do you, 
look inside yourself right now. You feel the shifting going on? See, your reality shifting because your environment is this total immersion. Your reality shifting. But you're starting to see that you've been shortchanged. If the word of God says that the Lord has already been to our future and has paved a way to it, then all you have to do is look at what it says in both Psalms and in, uh, in Proverbs, where both Solomon and David said, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. The steps of the righteous are ordered, they're numbered. They have a number, just go to the next number. They have an assignment. How do I get you out of the, way, the thought, the misconception that God's random? He's not random. This world's fallen and it appears to be random. That's how the devil works. But it's not random with you. It's intentional. If I don't obey God, then it doesn't happen. He goes to someone else. You take the opportunity because you know one day you're going to be audited and you're going to see that that was your opportunity and you didn't take it. See, you're, you're not down here surviving. You're down here thriving. You're down here being, being led by the Spirit. Opportunities will appear if God has to create one for you. If he doesn't have what you're asking for, he'll create it. Listen, there's a difference between God forming something out of something that already exists and ex nihilo, which means he takes something out of nothing. God forms, but he also creates. Yeah. Neither is hard for him. It takes the same. To raise the dead or cast out the devil. It's like, okay, who's going to raise the dead over here? Who's going to cast out devils? Everybody goes over and casts out devils because it's easier. No, it's not any easier. It's not any harder. See, when you raise the dead, you're going and taking a person's spirit and, and you're, you're commanding them to come back. Jesus commanded Lazarus to come back, come forth. He took his spirit, put him back, pulled him back. Why? It wasn't time yet. He raised people from the dead because it wasn't their time. Now, I've had people that have said, I want to go. I've had situations where this Lord says they don't want to come back. And we're mad because they weren't raised. But it was because they didn't want to come back. And trust me, none of you want to come back. It's a Walmart without doors down here. You can go in, but you never leave. It's like you, you're trapped. You want to leave Walmart, but there's no doors. So people keep running into you with their carts and running ahead of you and getting that last tube of toothpaste that was 67 cents. They run ahead of you. You, you, you don't want to come back. And the conversations that I've had with close people, they, they, I talk to them, I've never, I, and it's the last conversation I have, even though I, know, I don't know that. But they're talking from the other realm. My father, he got healed of cancer and it came back. But he called me before we knew. And he was speaking from the other realm. He was prophesying. And he doesn't even believe that way. 
the per things he said to me were profound. Not spirit-filled. Baby Christian didn't understand healing. But in tears, he told my wife, I'm a Christian today because of that man he pointed to me. Because he showed me. He showed me what being a Christian is. He showed me by his faith. That's what my dad said. I'm a Christian because of Kevin. I watched him believe God, and I watched God come through for him over and over again. He was crying. He said, I'm a Christian because of that man. I see God in that man. So no, I wasn't just his son. I had so many people before they died call me and prophesy from the other realm. Just happened last week. Actually, this week. But it was last week when I got the call. The Lord said, call this person right now. It's the last conversation I had with them. And they said, it's really hard. I don't know if I want to stay. And I said, well, we need you down here. You're our head intercessor. They, this person prays for all the prayer requests to come in, which is a huge amount. So a couple months ago, if that, she was ready to leave. I got the call. I was with Jesse Duplantis. We went into his garage. We held hands. And said, I said, Jesse, I can't, I can't let go of her. I need her. He says, yeah, it's not her time. Let's, let's pray. So we agreed in the garage. The next morning, we got the, a call. She was up and about. She said, she said I, I went. And in heaven, Jesse... Kevin and Tony Kemp were standing there with Jesus and they said to me, you can't come. It's not your time. And she came back. She doesn't know. So she passed Monday. I believe it was Monday, right? Ryan's mom. But she, we talked. The Lord said, call her. So I called her a couple days before, and this is what she said. She said, why are you grieving? And I explained to her. I said, she says, you don't back off of, you don't back off. Do you realize what you're doing? And she started prophesying to me. So last I talked to her. This has happened over and over again. So this week, before I came here, the Lord told me, you're going to write a book. This is the name of it. You're going to make a CD series. This is the name of it. So I want you to do a CD series. And I need you to do this course called this. I don't say this because then people take it and write it. So I'm just not going to say anything. Okay, so I do this course, 25 sessions, on deliverance, and then he said, I do that, and when I'm, I'm to the next to last session, so I did, did 10 sessions a day. So two days of 10 sessions a day, and then one day of five. Then Lord, so I do that. On the last, next to last session, it's, it's on film, I'm by myself in the studio because everything's set up, auto, it's automated, so my staff lives all over the place, and they, they can control our studio for, remotely, so I don't need anybody there. I can film all day, and people that work for me can, can control the whole studio. So I'm filming, and all of a sudden I, I look, I look, and there's this bright there's this bright flash at the door, but there's no one there but me. So I, I look at my phone, at the cameras, and my wife is not there. Her vehicle has not pulled up. And so I keep te I'm teaching the whole time. And I'm looking, there's someone standing right there, 
and all my hair is standing up, except for my forehead, which doesn't have any. But I, I'm like thinking, no one's going to believe this. Then, this person starts singing the song of the Lord. And it's the most beautiful song I've ever heard. And walks right past me and out through the wall, and you can hear them singing outside, and they just fade away. There's nobody there. I've heard that song before twice. About 20 years ago, we were assistant pastors, and we were praying for the service the next day, and we were, we were praying. No one else in the building. And all of a sudden, this angel just comes in and sings the, the same song above our heads and just keeps going like this over and over and over again. I've heard this song three times. This has happened three times. It just happened this week. Again, the same song, but I can't tell you what it is. Negative Ghost Rider. <laughs> the pattern's full. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that because I can't. There's no way I can because it, it was a rhythmical. It was not, it, it did not have a staff timing. It did not have, it was beautiful. It was, it, it's elegant. It's tapestry. It's like a, a ballet dancer. You don't know what's going to be next, but you know it's going to be good. And um, this is what happened, this is what happened this week. And then when I went home, I did this, the CD series, Have You Been to the Altar Lately? Two CDs said, when I was done with it, I couldn't walk or talk, and I have not been able to do much since then. And I came here under this. I came under a, a, an encounter that I can't explain. I just did a CD set. I've done hundreds of them, but nothing like this. But the next one's going to be better than that. It keeps happening, people. 40 years of walking with the Lord, and something happened this week that I cannot explain to you. I can't sing the song to you. The reason I can't sing the song to you, it wasn't from this realm. Like all the albums I've done, there's four, I believe there's four albums now. I've done each of them because the Spirit of God came on me. People in my church, they sit and watch me play instruments that they know I can't play. They watch it. And if I can't find someone to play it, I just do it myself. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll play it. You play this. And sometimes I do an album all myself. But when you listen to those albums, I know there's no way I could do what I just did. And they're so from the other realm, there's no way that I can take credit for it. But see, what about you? What else is there that is coming forth out of you that's beyond what you can think? It's in your spirit. So we all need to make an adjustment and grow up and be mature right now. And we need to understand something, that if you can't trust God, if you ask for help, he will help you. Lord, I do believe. Can you help my unbelief? Okay. Can you say help? Okay. Well, that's a really good prayer. Why does it seem like a big step to go toward God? But it's huge amounts of steps, easy steps to get away from him. Why is it easier to be unholy than it is to be holy? Why is holiness not transferable? Why was the priest, he couldn't transfer holiness, it says, by the law. You cannot transfer holiness. But a priest could become unholy or unclean by someone unclean touching him. Or if he would touch something that was unclean, it would make him unclean, but yet he couldn't transfer holiness, it says in the law. You cannot, the, the priest cannot transfer holiness to someone else. Did you know that that's there? Okay, so why is it easier to lose it than it is to get it? Why does it cost something? I'll tell you why. The Lord is doing you a favor. He's making you diligent so that you can overcome the flesh. So you can overcome your fears and your doubt 
it strengthens you to be released and escape. And I want every one of you, before you leave and come back tonight, I want you to determine that you're going to escape the corruption that's in the world that's caused by lust by partaking of the precious promises. At what point do you not care if you're rejected anymore? At what point do you not care what people think? At what point do you just know if you're pleasing God, that's all you need? At what point do you escape? When you overcome, you overcome within yourself. You yield to the Spirit, and the Spirit causes you to go into overthrow. It's just a mode you go into. There is enough in here, there's enough people in here to have anything we ask for. Brother Hagen taught a group of, of women to pray in his, his church before he started a school. And he would train them how to pray. And it got to where he told us in class that he had to announce that the prayer group was meeting Monday morning. He said, so get your prayer requests in. But this is what he had to say. Now listen to what I'm saying here. He said, you better make sure that this is what you want when you turn it in because you're going to get it. And they, it didn't matter what it was. You would get it because they didn't understand doubt and fear. They didn't, they were, and, and I, I saw I saw, I saw glimpses of things in heaven that the people that have established the foundation in which we, we live and we believe, everything that's been established was by people that, that were moved by the Holy Spirit. And they wrote, and they made the foundation of what we now have built upon and we build upon. And they were of a different spirit. A spirit that represented what Jesus talked about in John 14, 15, and 16, and 17. I saw that John had tapped into something that was not recorded in the other Gospels. It's journalistic, but it's not theology like John is. I mean, everything Jesus says is theological, but you understand that if a person is going around keeping note, that Luke being a doctor is going to mention more about healing. And Mark, you know, his is pretty short. So it follows the personality. But John, John knew that he was the one that Jesus loved the best. He was the favorite. And if he didn't believe it, just ask him. He'd tell you. And in Moses, he was the most humble on the earth. Just ask him. He'll tell you. He wrote. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote Genesis, and he didn't even live during that time. So how did he get it? From another realm. The angels gave it to him. Did you hear me? Moses wrote Genesis. Moses wrote Psalms 91. The secret place. Why? Because he encountered that what he wrote was from the cleft of the rock. I just saw the Lord's foot come down. And everything in creation knows when he does that, they understand that, even if I don't. I have, I have seen things that I didn't understand, but I have to tell them to you. The Spirit of the Lord is saying, I am willing, but the flesh is weak. The Spirit is so willing to go further and acquire in prayer 
whatever you desire. But you have to frame your world by the word of God so that you are in the vine. You're tapping into the vine. And we're the branches. So we're in, in the Lord and he's in us. We're one. We're tapped in. And there's an agreement. And it gets rid of a lot of paperwork. It's a short button. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Just a couple more minutes. I'm delaying it. I, want, I wanted to go a long time ago. But you have to make a decision. Don't wait for Congress. You've got to make a decision. The church is the most powerful institution on this earth. The body of Christ is the most powerful entity on this earth. The church of the living God. The gates of hell can't prevail against it. That is the absolute truth. That is the absolute truth. It doesn't matter how many times you've been mowed over in the last three months. It doesn't matter. To God, it doesn't matter. What he said is true. I have to believe him. I live and move and have my being in him. I'm moved by the Spirit. So are you. You love because God loved you. You're taught to walk in the Spirit because the Spirit is in you and is your counselor. Always ready and willing. I saw that in Tampa, while all this was happening in my studio, all these recordings, I saw how much it's up to each individual on what they encounter here. But I saw that a lot of you are dealing with trauma. You're trying to figure out what just happened. I'm going to tell you what just happened. But because of the algorithms, I'm not going to say. I'm going to tell you a story. If there are any witches in here, you need to repent and come up here and let me pray for you. If you're not saved and you want to give your life to the Lord, you need to get up here right now. This is a story. When I was 15 years old, I had been beaten up so much. Because, see, the Lord had anointed me, just like he anoints you, just like King David, just we're all anointed to serve. But, see, kids don't know why they do what they do. Most grown-ups don't even know what they do, why they do what they do. But I got beat up all the time. And one day when I was 15 years old, I just got tired of it. And my parents couldn't afford much of anything. I was already working at 14. And so I made a weight set out of the gallon jugs of milk I filled them with water, I got a metal pipe, and I put two on each side. Six and a half pounds, I think, well, that's fuel, so I don't know what a gallon of water is. It might be a little more, is it like eight? But anyway, six and a half for fuel or whatever. And so I put water in there, and I started doing curls and all kinds of, like, military, military, you know, put, you know everything. So I, I just did it. Well, I started on purpose, in May when school got out. I ate everything that didn't move. I worked out three times a day. Yeah, and when I got, in September when I showed up, they thought there was a new guy in the school. And I kid you not, I had no problem anymore because I did something about it. I didn't, have to, I didn't have to do a thing. Well, maybe I pumped up a little bit in the bathroom before I went to class every morning, but you know. I'm serious. I'm talking like 30, 40 pounds of muscle. And this is what happened. It was fine for a while, and then I asked if I could be on the senior track team 
and the diving team and the swim team when I was really, you know, you're not really supposed to do that when you're in the lower grades, but I said, you know, why don't you just get your stopwatch, meet me after school, and I'll change your mind. And I ran and I broke a record as a tryout. And then they gave me a shot put. Then they gave me a pole for pole vaulting. Then they gave me a discus. They said, you can take that home. I want you to practice a lot. Here's a javelin too. Well, what happened? Well, all of a sudden, I went and I, I went into diving and I beat the people that were seniors. I went to states. My second year of diving, I was in states. Okay, then all of a sudden, something else happened. It, it changed again. Now, the big guys, they were the one to challenge me for a, a territorial thing. I kid you not. I'm like, no. They were mad because they would go out drinking all weekend and then Monday they'd show up for the track meet and I would beat them because I drank milk and weight gain from Joe Weeder. <laughs> I didn't drink, so I wasn't drunk. I didn't take drugs. So I would get off the school bus as a junior and a senior, and behind me was a car with one of these big football players. And they're like, I'm gonna kill you. Was I, did, it, did I do something wrong? Was it, what? Right at the bus stop. The road split into a triangle went down and split. My house was up there. This kept happening, and I would lay these guys out, and then the next one would come next week. And it got to where I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Well, what happened? Well, I just went to another level. You don't, do you understand what I'm saying or not? You see, I thought I was resolving one problem, So this guy, he is so much taller than me, so much bigger than me, and he's a football player. He goes, let's go. And I'm like, no, I don't want to fight you. You're my friend. You were my friend a couple weeks ago until your testosterone kicked in. Now, now you got to prove, and all the girls are cheering, and I'm like, this is like a sport. Well, I turned into Claude Van Damme. And I, I don't know what happened, but he took a swing at me. He took a swing at me. Now, I don't know if you understand this, but I was called at 10, but I didn't get saved till I was 19. I don't understand that, and please don't ask me about it, because I don't know. But all I know is, is when that man threw that punch, it was Matrix. I knew what was going to happen because I saw it happen before it happened. And the guy was knocked out, laying at my feet. And they had to tell me to stop or I would have killed him. And all I wanted to do was finish high school and go to college and go to the Air Force Academy. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't have a I had track records, but no criminal record. I just wanted to keep it that way. Okay, so what happened? See, it's spiritual atmospheres that you don't know anything about. Okay, so years and years later, I'm in college. I'm having this dream about that triangle. And I'm always having a dream about standing in that triangle in my own hometown. And I'm still, I'm having dreams. I'm sitting in this baby desk in elementary school and I'm a full grown up going to the Air Force Academy or now I'm, I'm in college, I didn't go to the Air Force Academy and I'm having these dreams for years. I'm in college, getting my bachelor degree. When I was getting my two year degree above that, I was still having this dream and there's kids all around me and they're like, 
dude, you know, don't you have a job? And I kept going to that triangle in my dreams. And the Lord said, that's your battleground. That's the devil you got to take out. You haven't, you haven't graduated. And so that day, I ceased to be a victim. And I've never had those dreams again. I graduated. I don't have those dreams anymore, that triangle, because I took out that giant because I am no longer a victim. You're not going back. If you're having recurrent dreams, it's because you are stuck and God is showing you you need to graduate. If you're having dreams about going back to your school, if you're going back to that place where, where those, those things happened, it's because you need to resolve that and go on. You are not a victim. You get it? Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the power of your spirit right now, the power of deliverance. I speak to every evil spirit that has attached itself to these, these events that happened as a victim. I break the power of trauma right now in the name of Jesus, and I command you evil spirits to leave right now. I break, I break the power of the enemy. I drive you out right now. You must go. I see you, and you must go. You cannot stay. I release the children of the Most High God. I command you to leave them go now. In Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus seals this. Holy Spirit, occupy those places. Fill them right now. And the Lord says, I have been waiting for you to come to me. I have been waiting to reconcile. I have such great plans. My purposes stand. I love you. I believe in you. Walk with me. I will explain. I will reveal myself. Trust in me. Let me love on you. Receive me. The Lord wants to love on you right now. If you'll come, please. Father, I thank you so much as, as your love is poured out right now in this room. And you heal us. Your visitation, it restores our spirit, our heart right now. Honestly, you're really too good for this world. The world doesn't deserve you. They're not going to treat you right. No one is going to treat you what you're worth. No one's going to pay you what you're worth. But the Lord will. The Lord keeps track of everything. I am telling you. I was in heaven. I'm telling you. God keeps track of everything. And he will repay. He loves you. And he wants you to know that. This is not a bedtime story. I am telling you the truth. Nothing escapes his notice. He remembers the sacrifice when you stood in faith, when you loved where you thought you couldn't go any further and you still loved, when you stayed in there. Even when you fell, he saw your faith. You got up. You kept going. There's a reward for that. I'm telling you. You know, you know what's, you, you, would, you would believe it. I would turn on TBN 
because I needed a word from God. And, and R.W. Schambach would say, you know what you need to do? And he'd point right at the camera. He says, you need to swing out over hell and spit the devil in the eye. I'm like, something would rise up in me. And I'm like, wow, that is, that is like not from this realm. That, that is faith. And listening to a tape of a man say, I believe this Bible so much that you can drop me out of an airplane in the middle of the desert and come back and pick me up in three years and I'll have a city there. I'm like, oh my God. I just met that man like three weeks ago, finally. That happened in 1982 when I listened to that tape. Changed my life. That man changed my life. Kenneth Copeland. And I just met him three weeks ago. Okay, another man. Another man. When I would listen to him, I could pray in tongues for three hours, but without that tape, I could pray 10 minutes. I would feel the power of God on me so strongly that I felt like I met the man, but I never met him. I listened to him for three years, that tape, over again for three hours every day, and I prayed in tongues three hours a day. I missed two meals a day for three years and prayed in tongues. I, I spent 12 midnight to 7 a.m. armed security, and then checked my sidearm into a safe and went to class until 2 p.m. I stayed up all night armed security and I went to college from 7 to 2. Still found three hours to pray in tongues with this man. The power of God was so strong on me that I decided that I would abandon everything and do what those men had done. Then one day, this man walked by me, and it was the man that was on that tape, Benny Hinn. And the same power and presence that was on that tape that I prayed for for years and years and years was now before me. And he looked at me and he said, the Lord told me I have to talk to you. So he sat with me an hour, and the power of God came on me, and he prophesied over me. And he said, the Lord's telling me that you're going to have my anointing. So I'm going to give it to you. And he transferred it to me in 1986. He, does, to this day, does not know it was that tape. He does not know why he had to talk to me. The same power that was on the tape came on me with the man. When I met Kenneth Copeland, the same power that was what he said on that tape came on me when I shook his hand. It was the same spirit. It was recorded on the tape. So that's why I have the book table. That's why I have the CDs. It's because I know. I listened to Andrew Walmack until I started talking like him. I am so excited right now. I could just run around the room. I listen to him. I have everything. Kathy knows it. Kathy, can I work an extra three days so I can buy his tape series and all his stuff? I bought everything that Andrew Walmack had. For 10 years, I saturated myself with it. And he gave it for free, but I wouldn't take it for free. I wanted to pay for it. So I would work extra and buy everything he had. I said, someday I'm going to have a set with a fireplace behind it. I'm going to sit at a table, nice and cozy. I'm going, to have, I'm going to have a shirt that has warrior notes, my logo, nice shirt. I'm going to wear the matching t-shirt that shows right here like he does. I want to be just like him. I want to be just like Brother Hagen, except I wanted my belt to be a lot lower. Like he, he wore his pants up here shortly. So, I noticed that all my friends, when they went in the ministry, they all had their pants up here in short ties. All my pastor friends, you know, like, no, it's the anointing, man. That's not the dress. Just concentrate on the anointing. So I realized, I realized that what is happening here is what the Lord said through Benny Hinn. He told me that in 1986. What is happening now is because of him.
It's because of Brother Hague. It's because of Andrew Wolmeck and a whole bunch of other people. Each person, each general, Jesse Duplantis, all these people, my pastor, Kathy Duplantis, she's a woman, she's my pastor. I still have the anointing on me with a woman pastor. Can you believe that? A woman, a woman, a woman, my pastor. Think about it. You know, and it's so funny is, it's so funny is, is that in college, it's like uh, they would send the women to the mission field, you know, to be eaten by the cannibals, but they won't let them be a pastor in the United States. No, I'm serious. My denomination, they, they, you could be, as a woman, you can go to the missionary field and, and not be somebody's lunch. Send them in harm's way. But you can't be over a man in the United States. Think about it. What is it in your spirit that's going to rise above everything right now? And you're going to walk out of this place in your destiny because you're going to judge now that you can do something about it. It's not too late. You can, you can let the Lord reroute you. If God knows where you're at because of, you know, or Visa knows where you're at, then God knows where you're at. So why can't he reroute you right now? Why can't he start to give you instruction? Oh, I've been there, man. I've been there. I've been there where my instruments went out and I had to rely on the controller to tell me what direction to go in. Because I had no, I had no, I had my instruments went out. I had a trust on that voice. I just, I told him, I said, man, I'm trusting you. You got to tell me. That's how you navigate through this life. still small voice it's a voice inside your heart the Lord is speaking right now he's saying come away with me let's visit and talk together the whole idea if you do any kind of study on the secret place if you look at the verbiage and if you look at some of the things that David wrote it's the idea of sitting on a couch with a friend and sharing your heart intimate secrets with God I tell him everything I tell them everything. Every time I'm standing back here before I come out here, I go, it's going to be a mess if you don't come with me. It's going to be ugly. And it's going to be documented on film. It'll be a big smoking hole if you don't do something. But my heart for you is the heart of your father. Is is that you would produce fruit in keeping with repentance. It's that you would display your father as he wants to live through you and show the world that he is the only true God. Come away with me on the wings of the Spirit. Come to me. I will give you rest. Those who are heavy and laden. <laughs> I will teach you. Take my yoke upon and learn of me. I am easy and gentle. The wings of the Spirit. 
we will fly together. I'm coming, I'm coming to take you away with me, my love. I long to be with you. I want to look into your eyes. My creation. I want you to know me. I want to show you many things that you know not of. I want to explain things to you. I want you to know how good I am. Come away with me, my love. The world does not deserve you. Raptured in his presence. Caught up in the counsel of God. Nothing else really matters except to see your smile, to know that you're pleased. The glorious church shall prevail, the body shall prevail. cloud of witnesses right now is yelling and cheering us on the cloud of witnesses are saying we did it you can do it we did it you can do it come on we did it you can do it hallelujah we worship we worship you father hallelujah we worship the lamb holy and righteous and worthy is the lamb that was slain waves of the Spirit of God are washing over you right now. Just raise your hands. Everybody stand. Everybody stand and just raise your hands. Prophesy. Prophesy. Prophesy.
and you're worth my yes you can have it all God cause you're worth my yes you're worth my yes and you're worth my yes every part of me Jesus and you're worth my you're worth my yes. You are worth my yes, yes, and nothing less. So we bring you our very best, and nothing less. Our very best, and nothing less. Our very best, and nothing less. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. in my defense 